Okay, everybody see that okay? Looks good to me. Great. Um, I guess my camera is still on. I'm gonna turn that off here. I'm gonna be working largely from notes, so. Um, let me just start my timer and we're good. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Uh, my name is Michael Cooker. My day job is transportation planner, but my true passion is history. Um, two of the things I like most about it is that it requires detective work where you synthesize different elements and resources into a new whole, and it helps explain why things are the way they are. And in that respect, it's a lot like transportation planning. And so I was asked to prepare this presentation. It kind of melds those two elements. What's really remarkable, remarkable about the history of transportation planning in the region is how little routes have changed over the years. Uh, today's I-5 largely follows the route of Highway 99, which largely followed the routes of old stagecoach roads, which largely followed the trails of the indigenous people. And each iteration results in a smoother, straighter route, but if we look today carefully on the side of the road as we whiz by at 70 miles an hour, we can still see old sections of highway that have been bypassed. And the other interesting thing about transportation planning is how long those decisions tend to stick around. Today, some of the oldest roads built in the region are still being used today. And I'm not sure if I've got a pointer on here. Let me, do I have a pointer? No? Okay. Uh, the original road between Red Bluff and Old Shasta uh, is basically parts of Swayze Drive now. And uh, what was once the original railroad route north of Redding is now the Sacramento River and Rail Trail. Uh, what you're looking at right now is an overlay of a 1901 USGS map on top of a current map. And you can see how many of the routes that predate the arrival of the automobile in Shasta County are still being used today. So as a planner, it reminds me to be extremely circumspect about the decisions I make. Uh, so with that said, let's kick off the main presentation. Let's see here, why are you not advancing? There we go. Uh, the title comes from a complaint about roads that was allegedly the reason for the State of Jefferson protest of 1941, but it applied equally well to earlier times. Now, I don't have a background, a formal background in GIS or cartography, so hopefully you'll get some new information out of this. Um, this map here is drawn from surveys from John Fremont's expeditions, and it's dated 1848. It's credited to Charles Pruce, a surveyor and cartographer who accompanied Fremont on several of his expeditions, but this map is actually based on information kept on a third expedition of which Proust was not a part. And one of the things I found interesting about this map was the spelling of Mount Shasta. Um, it's a little pixelated, but it's spelled T-S-A-H-T-L. For thousands of years, this was the primary mode of transportation in California, foot. Horses didn't arrive in California until 1769 when they were brought by the Spanish. And the Shasta region was largely ignored by, by the Spanish and Mexican governments. Although traders from the Hudson Bay Company often came through using the trails of the indigenous people. The wagon trains to California were usually pulled not by horse, but by oxen. Scholars put the percentage of pioneer wagons pulled by oxen at one half to three quarters. Mules were strong, could go faster, but they were often too tricky to handle and they had a tendency to bolt and become unruly. The oxen were slower, but more reliable and tougher. They were willing to eat poor grass and they were quite strong. They could haul fully loaded wagons up ravines or out of mud holes. A large wagon needed at least three pair of oxen to pull it. And contrary to the movies, people usually walked beside the wagon as seen here. Once American settlers arrived as part of the gold rush, foot was still the most common mode of travel. The average person walks at a clip of, a, of about three miles per hour, so you can imagine the difficulty tra traveling about the state. One of the first revolutions of travel in California was the steamboat. Steamboats were regularly plying Sacramento by 1852, slowly clearing the way north of snags as they went. 
And practical steamboat travel north eventually stopped at Red Bluff, but there were attempts to bring them as far north as Middle Creek, and I know they went up to at least Clear Creek at one point. Stagecoach also became common in the 1850s. Uh, this is a variant called a mud wagon, which was used more, more commonly locally. Uh, it was smaller, narrower, and simpler than the Concord coaches that we see in the Wells Fargo commercials. Uh, they fit better on the narrow, windy roads, and they were uh, about half the price of those Concord coaches. Uh, this photo was taken on what's now the River Trail. Um, at one time, it was the, the main road between Old Shasta and Reading. Speaking of Old Shasta, Old Shasta was also known as the head of woe navigation. In the earliest days, freight arrived to Shasta by mule train or coach, and then would be loaded on mule or jackass, to harken back to the title of this presentation, and carried on to their ultimate destinations like Weaverville or Wairika. U.S. Army specifications for pack mules state that American mules can carry up to 20% of their body weight for 15 to 20, 20 miles a day in the mountains. There are some anecdotal reports of 350 to 400 pounds, and even a reference to some 600 to 800 pounds per mule. But the big revolution in transportation was the railroad, so big, in fact, that it spawned its own town, our town. The, Reading arrived in, the railroad arrived in Reading in 1872, and the town was in fact founded by the railroad company. Railroads were granted land by the government alongside their route in an alternating checkerboard pattern. The idea was is that these land grants would help subsidize the company's efforts. The company would sell off some, hold on to others. Um, Sierra Pacific Industries, the largest private landowner in California, in fact, purchased much of its holdings from Southern Pacific Railroad, which was a descendant of the California Oregon Railroad. So the company needed to marshal its resources for building north through the mountains and Reading was the end of the railroad line from 1872 to 1883. Initial surveys for a route connecting California and Oregon, however, began in 1854. Uh, this survey was published by the federal government and it's a really fascinating read. It not only discusses the geography, but the geology, the flora and the fauna, the weather, and the indigenous people along the route. Oops, I skipped on my notes here. One of the most important early mappers of the Shasta region was a man named William McGee, pictured here. And here we have an 1866 map of the Middle Creek area that was uh, created by him. You can see just north of the river trail in, in the areas uh, along Quartz, Quartz Hill and those subdivisions, it's, it's unmapped at this point, just says rough hills covered with dense chaparral. Um, so let's take a little closer look at this. Down here on the bottom, you can see the notes and uh, different elements of the survey and when, when they were surveyed uh, going down to 1866 when this, this map was created. Uh, and signed off on. But you can see that uh, Mr. McGee did some of the township lines and section lines and the, the meanders the right bank of the river. And you can see the points along here. And uh, as a historian, these are really great because not only do they have uh, geographic features, but they also have landmarks. So here you have stuff like um, Waz Ferry at its original location, which was closer to the, to the uh, what's now the Ribbon Bridge and the original road to Shasta, which was further north than Middle Creek Road. And uh, down here in the middle, you can see Salt Creek, which served as a boundary for Major uh, Redding's land grant. And between, you can see Middle Creek, which was, you know, one of the larger gold-bearing tributaries of the Sacramento River. Uh, there's a lot of artistry in this, I think. And uh, sometimes they're just fun to pour over. Uh, this is an early plat of Reading as laid out by the railroad. Um, a lot of us know, but in case, in case you haven't heard it, there's a reason for the names. Um, you have West Street, South Street, East Street, and North Street, which is now called Eureka Way. And those were the boundaries of the original town area. And then um, going from the top, you also have Oregon and California Street 
which you know are the two states the railroad was connecting and then going the other way you had the counties that the railroad, railroad, railroad was going through so you had sacramento Ca county placer county yuba county butte county tehama county shasta county and you can see the railroad kept a section in the in the heart of the town for its own use called the railroad reservation it was lands that they reserved for themselves you can, you can see we had a a roundhouse at one point and this was before Tehama Street was opened so at the time Tehama Street dead ended at the railroad reservation and you couldn't get from one side of the town to the other using that road here's a closer view at the railroad reservation showing the roundhouse the freight depot and uh, one of the many passenger depots I believe this one pictured here burned at some point uh, here's a later map of the town of Reading. Um, this is probably one of the cruder maps I've found in terms of artistry and accuracy. It looks like the, the map kind of shifts uh, scales at some point. The, there's a note that's kind of cropped out of this view uh, that the bottom left corner is at a different scale. And it's, it's interesting to me that even early on, this is 1887, there were plans to subdivide the land down in like the garden tract area in Cyprus area. But even though these lands were plotted, there was no develop, development made on them. Not until after the dam was built. And this is an 1890 map, just three years later. You can see how much larger the area is. This reflects that Reading went through a boom uh, in, after the, the 1880s uh, when it became county seat and became incorporated that really gave a huge boost to the town. And so there was a lot of uh, real estate speculation. Again, you can see the garden tract area is somewhat charted out. Uh, as far as I know, that was never really developed. Let me zoom in here. Uh, here you can see half of the Reading Cemetery and uh, north of that it says Fairview. That's now part of the Reading Cemetery also, but at this time it was a farm called Fairview Farm. And uh, one thing that I wanted to, to point out that this map shows is this map obviously predates the aggregate extraction for Shasta Dam. And so the area where the aggregate came from on this map is labeled uh, mining ground. And what this shows is the actual true Turtle Bay. A lot of us, including myself for a long time, thought Turtle Bay was this area over where all the gravel was aggregated in the mining ground, but it's actually this notch of land right here at the saw, sawmill property. And uh, we'll take a closer look at that later. So that's actually the true Turtle Bay is that little notched area in there. Uh, this is another kind of map that's really helpful to historians. This was a promotional map. This was prepared in the winter of 1888 and 1889 by a man named W.W. Elliott of San Francisco. Uh, this sort of map was used to help advertise the community and two local boosters, the Hahn brothers, uh, one of them had a subdivision named after him, ordered 5,000 copies between the two of them to distribute. And this view was sketched from Bostwick Hill, which is the hill more or less where uh, Mercy Hospital is now. And the artist made money by drawing and selling the views of the buildings around the perimeter of the map. So he would go up to somebody and say, hey, do you want do you want me to uh, draw your building on this map? You know, give me some money and I'll do that. And you know, it'll be good for you. And so looking at the map here, you can again see Turtle Bay up here in the top and the sawmills drawn there. And you can see that the scale and the uh, perspective's a little wonky, but it's still a really useful map. So like, here's a view of the Oddfellows Hall, which still stands in downtown Reading today. And you can see the facade drawing is, is quite accurate to how it looked at the time. And what's more, I apologize for the pixelation, but even the, the buildings that weren't on the perimeter, just the ones that were little tiny ones in this view are quite accurate. So this is a block that I've been researching for a, a while. It's where the Bell Rooms is now. And uh, this is a photo of that, one of the earliest houses in Reading that stood on that. And uh, you can see the little sketch of the building there uh, is quite similar. It's got the chimney, it's got the peaked roof, it's got the, the two-story porch. So it's not unuseful. 
And this is probably the uh, best of all for any historian. This is called a Sanborn map. Uh, this was done by the Sanborn company and they were used for fire insurance purposes. And uh, these are quite accurate. This is the earliest one done for Reading. It was done for 1885. Um, if you look at it, you can see this was the year before we had um, a dark moment in our history and expelled the Chinese from Reading. So here you can see the location of Reading's original Chinatown on the left, uh, block 38 there. So that would be the block kind of where Taco Bell is today. And you can see California Street was the main street. Um, and I'll go into that in a minute, but you can see how built it up it is compared to Market Street at the time. That's because the railroad was the heart of the town and all of the businesses wanted to be next to the railroad. So drilling down a little, this is a view of California Street and uh, the intersection of Butte Street. And so these maps are really dense with information. They're color coded, which is somewhat troubling if you're colorblind like myself, but you can look and you can determine, you know, what the buildings were built of, what sort of features they had. And they were primarily interested in, in fire related features. So like there's a note here on uh, block 19 where it says IRCL outside only that says ironclad outside only. They're looking for things that, that help, uh, help reduce fire threats. And on the other one, you have heavy filled doors. Uh, the paler color is for wood frame buildings. And over on the right, um, where it says Cleves and Averill, uh, what they would do if there were changes to it is that they would paste an update on top of it. So I think what we're seeing below that is the remnants of the original building that was on that. Um, sometimes that kind of thing shows up better on microfilm scans, but the microfilm generally isn't colorized. So it's a hit and miss. So take a, take a look at this. You've, you've got the Breslauer building here on the corner. You've got the Paragon Hotel here in the, basically the middle of the screen. And you can see where, what's brick and what's frame. I'm gonna show you a photo from the same time. So over on the left, you have the, the Breslauer building. And yes, indeed, that is a brick building. And just to the left of it is the oldest brick building in Reading that was torn down in the 1960s. And then you have across the street from it, you have the C.C. Bush building behind that oak tree. And then you have the Paragon Hotel, which we can see is made out of frame lumber. And then another brick building here on the corner of Yuba Street. So these photos or these maps are a gold mine for historians. I've used these in a lot of, uh, I was commissioned to do a survey of historic structures in Reading. So I relied on these quite a bit. And uh, they're really useful when, when you have a photo to try and identify like a, a time frame that the photo was taken. And they had quite artistic elements as well. This is from the cover of the 1896 one. Uh, this is the oldest aerial photo I found for Reading. This was taken in 1923. Um, I believe my understanding is that it was taken by the army. They were looking, it was part of a survey to find airfields and uh, what eventually became Benton Field was a result of this. There's three other photos in the series. So what's interesting about this is you can see that basically nothing is developed beyond the original plat of the land. Um, Anything below the bench into what's now the garden tract is all farmland just because it was still prone to flooding. If we zoom in, uh, this is a kind of an interesting thing here. This helped me narrow down the date of the photo really well. What you're seeing is a view of Pine Street School, uh, either under construction and nearly complete or complete, along with the two older Pine Street schools that also stood on that lot before they were torn down after the completion of the current Pine Street School. So the, using newspaper articles, I was able to narrow, narrow down, find like, you know, a range of months that this was taken. And uh, this is a view on the, the land north of the river. Uh, you can see what's now Benton Avenue. At the time, this was the Pacific Highway. This was the main north-south drag for Reading. Um, and 
So that's Benton Drive and then going north, it's now what's Lost Lane. And, and I think it's also called the Highway 99 Trail up there and it runs kind of behind, uh, oh gosh, that, it's a Bethel building now, I believe. And you can see a dredger at work at what's now uh, Codwell Park area. And uh, here again, here's a view of the true Turtle Bay. Um, and you can see it's a little notch of land sticking out. They would float uh, logs down the river for a lumber drive. There was a sawmill there at Turtle Bay. And that, that uh, feature was used to kind of corral the logs. They would stretch, they would block off the river from that spit there and just kind of guide them all into that area until they could be sawed for lumber. Uh, this is the oldest direct overhead photo I found of Reading, and this was taken in 1931. Um, this is from a flight commissioned by the State Division of Highways, which is the predecessor for Caltrans. And uh, this, is, this shows the photos that were taken on the flight and the location of where the photo was taken, essentially. So we'll take a closer look at it here. Um, here you can see, again, there's nothing going on in the garden tract. Uh, you can see that the, the city park is under development and that the main drag at this point going east of town is the old free bridge. So Cypress dead ended before even the canal. And uh, what do we have here? This is from, I have my slides out of order, it looks like. Okay. This is from a 1940 aerial photo of Reading. And so what I found is um, you had the 1931 uh, State Highways Aerial Survey, and then uh, you had a 1940 survey that was done by Pacific Telephone, uh, presumably to relocate lines as part of the Shasta Dam project. And then you had another 1941 survey by the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, again, this is a July 19 photo, 1940 photo of Reading, and uh, this shows the train trestle under construction. Down at the bottom, you can see it's not quite complete, uh, but the, the new Market Street has been built. That was built in 35. Um, hotels are already starting to pop along up at the very north end of it. Over on the right of the photo, you can see the conveyor belt running. Uh, Turtle Bay is still very much visible there. Um, you can see all of that land just north of Reading uh, in the Codwell Park area and, and like the uh, Arboretum area. That was all worked over pretty good as part of a gravel program. And also you can see the path of the dredger going about dead center in the photo. <laughs> so um, that area is not, it's not pristine virgin land. It's all been worked over pretty good. Uh, we're doing a pretty good job of trying to heal it, but it's, it's not what it was, that's for sure. And uh, this is a view, you can see that the, the aggregate operation is underway at Turtle Bay. Uh, that area dead center with kind of the rays coming out of it, that would be where the monolith is. Uh, the monolith is the foundation for the sorting plant there. Um, you can see that they're starting to take big chunks of land away over on the bend at the river. And then here, this is a view, uh, keep in mind this is 1940, this is before there was any development to speak of. Um, this is a view of Hilltop Drive. And as you can see, its route has pretty much stayed the same since then. Uh, probably had its origins as a wagon route at some point because of the various bridges over the, the river or lack thereof at the time. So um, drive, it starts down at the bottom right corner and then where it turns, it makes the same turn now to go over the freeway. So the freeway would be between that line and the river. And then it just follows the same route where all of the apartments are. So all of these resources are really a tremendous, tremendous tool for historians. And uh, hopefully it, you found this presentation somewhat educational. Oh, I think you're muted.
I really enjoyed that, Michael. I, I think uh, it not only is fascinating to learn about our history, but there's a lot of contemporary applications to it. Um, one of the things that I was just thinking about is that um, <clears throat> our students have been learning about how you can uh, geo-reference uh, historic photos. Um, and so it'd be really interesting to take some of those historic photos that you presented, geo-reference them, and then be able to put a contemporary road network that you could then put a transparency on and see sort of what alignment you had between the historic roads and and uh, and the contemporary ones. Yeah, I would love to learn how to do that myself. I, basically, I do all of my kind of his history re related GIS stuff in Google Earth, and I, I do as the best I can. But you can still gain insight from it by you know plotting locations of certain events or or camps or whatever, and then looking at it through a larger lens. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I think that's an example of where a lot of the geospatial tools are, there are many of them out there, and, and you know, you can do some really interesting things uh, with something like Google Earth. Um, I did put a link out um, to some resources and some other links that are out there. Um, Lots of good feedback on your presentation. I was happy to see that, um, uh, I don't know if he's still on, but uh, Fred Desjardins from the California Map Society, I've been um, sitting in on, on some of their Zoom presentations and they do a lot of historic mapping. It was, your talk was really kind of right in line with uh, some of the things that I've seen presented there. And uh, again, you can check out uh, on the link that I, that I put out a few minutes ago. Um, so we were talking about trying to do a, um, a breakout um, just for a couple minutes. Uh, Devin, do you see the, the uh, breakout tool in your, um, on your screen since you were the one that set this guy up initially? Yes, I do. So I have 41 participants and it looks like I can increase the rooms and it of course then separates participants yeah just let's let's just do just you can just take the auto setting and if it has a time on it let's let's set it to five minutes and okay I'll, I'll put six rooms it says five or seven rooms five to six people per room and say create room and i guess it'll probably prompt me i haven't done this one but probably prompt me for a time yeah i'm, I'm throwing you uh throwing you under the bus here on, on setting up no it's okay not a problem i should yeah. figure it out yeah, yeah, go ahead and set it up and, and uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. These were the, um, the questions that I had uh, put together. It's a way of kind of, you know, giving a chance for folks to uh, interact a little bit. So I have settings here. It says breakout rooms close automatically after five minutes. Does that sound good? Yep. And it'll have a countdown of 60 seconds. And I'm going to go ahead and open all rooms. It looks like it just kind of automatically separates everybody. Great. And so, we all know each other. You guys, I'm yeah, just, look at that. Look at all these awesome people. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that work out? I feel bad on the camera. <laughs> this is the insider. Wait, I've got a whole different set of questions for you guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I think we should put Eamon on the spot here. Make him sure. perform. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's been going great. I feel like all the presentations have been really sweet. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it's going well. We've had, boy, you know, this kind of reminds me of, well, of course, it helps when you bribe students with points, you know, but <laughs> um, we've had way more, you know, we've had a, a good collection of people, which is uh, really, yeah. including a bunch of names I didn't recognize. It was like at 60 at one point. Yeah. Yeah, there's some people that I noticed uh, from the California GIS Council and from CGIA and from ERISA that I've never seen interact in North State stuff. That's awesome. You know, that's Marcus gets a gets a nod for that one because I think he gave the heads up. I was telling Marcus that I um, actually maybe I did let Jane know about it last minute yesterday, but I signed on to be on their um, their their <laughs> education work group. Hey guys. Oh yeah. So it, it put us all together. <laughs> I, I saw you guys and I was able to, I guess because I'm the host, I didn't get assigned or something. So it lets me join where I want. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's the way it works. <laughs> so I thought I'd come we join feel you so guys. lucky. <laughs> so um, 
your job is to go to all the groups and make sure they're not talking about the 49er game. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's going to let us right out of these, huh? Put us back in the main meeting. I felt like I left the meeting and it was going to, I didn't know where it went, so. <laughs> hey, 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 Dan, this is Steve. I, I got a question for you. That was a real interesting, interesting presentation by Matt. And, you know, he referenced that, that T, that T analysis uh, or that educational tool. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's really intriguing. You know, the way I feel nowadays, I, I feel more just like a linear line. I, I don't necessarily have a T coming off because mm -hmm. I feel like I need to know so many different things and it's hard to really focus on one thing. But I was wondering, you know, do you, do you um, implement that style much or influence kids to do, do that these days? Or what's your thought on, thought on that? In principle, but I've never heard of that either. <laughs> there was a bunch of things like that that, um, you know, Matt's, uh, he's, he's a big thinker and, and uh, there was, there's quite a few things in there that kind of were things I probably would have needed to Google, but, but um, no, I, I think the principle of it, and actually, Steve, I would argue that this kind of thing is exactly the kind of thing that promotes that sort of T-shaped thing because you get to get out of your linear, you know, you're sitting here trying to figure out how to implement your imagery application for X, Y, or Z, and then you step back and it's like, oh, cool, there's stuff going on in conservation and people are doing stuff in free and open source and, you know, that sort of thing. Yep. So. Yeah, his presentation was packed with stuff. I mean, how much, like, all the different impl implications of their work was, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, I, I just I just hope that he, he doesn't pull away a lot of our good GIS resources from this area. And everyone's going to want to work for the Nature con or Conservancy now. Well, I think his point, though, and I think we're kind of starting to see this, is that, man, geospatial is just kind of popping up everywhere, you know. And, um, and obviously, you know, there's this higher level sort of analysis and, and you know, programming and customization. And then there's... And hopefully we'll see the same kind of thing on the on the grassroots level. Hi, Melinda. I uh, pulled her in. It said that people weren't joined oh. and to a meet to a group, but I think she's not joined. I think it's because she's not. I don't know what that really means. It says next to her name, not joined. I don't know if she's here or not. Anyway, but I I'm here. Oh, okay. Hey, Devin. Hi. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to step away and take a phone call. Gotcha. Uh, the last half an hour, so I just have joined back again. Okay, I, I'm new to these breakout rooms, so I apologize. I'm uh, not exactly no worries. sure what I'm doing there. No worries. <laughs> you did fine. It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. <laughs> oh, you can't see me. I'm just a voice. True, <laughs> but good to hear your voice. Thank you. So, Jen, what's going on? What did you think of uh, Michael's talk? You can it was great. I came in just for that one. Uh, I. I was in a, a, a California Transit Association conference earlier in the day. This is going so much better than that one. That oh, really? has lots of technical issues. So don't um, say that. We've uh, got a couple hours left. <laughs> oh no! This you guys are doing great. This will be great. I think it's when they try to go too uh, too complicated sometimes. Yeah. Um, but Michael's presentation, you know. I live in the garden track too. So he, I'd seen some of those photos before when I researched why my house floods. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm always appreciative of when he pulls out his, I call them, I think they're magic tricks. I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that was neat. Yeah. Yeah, I was really struck by how much it reminded me of some of those California map society meetings that I've been on, in on um, a lot of map collectors and things like that. Looks like we're going to go back. All right. Well, um, thanks for that. That was an experiment, by the way. That was a first ever breakout group. So <laughs> thanks, Kevin. It, it is kind of nice to have a chance to uh, to interact a little bit. And uh, again, some uh, some new names in the group, and it's it's great to have all of you uh, with us. Um, so I'm uh, I've been playing around a lot with story maps. Uh, again, if you go through the chat window, you can get the links to all the different maps that are being presented. I'm actually going to be talking about mapping the Klamath, um, and this actually uh, came <coughs> on the heels of another uh, story map, which again you can check out. Um, 
Glad to see Carol's uh, on the call since Carol was a student that I recruited initially to kind of figure out the, uh, the story map format, uh, which I haven't really dealt with. And this is actually an outgrowth of a talk I gave at the California Geographical Society meeting a couple of years ago um, on the Klamath uh, Physiographic Province. And so for the purposes of today, I wanted to kind of focus on the, um, the geospatial and, and cartographic method, some of the data sets that are out there. Um, and um, I uh, <clears throat> started off with some historic maps. And uh, I know many of you are familiar with the uh, Rumsey collection, which is a wonderful uh, tool and resource if you're not familiar with it. So I've just embedded the um, one of the, uh, the historic maps of, uh, of the region that we're going to be looking at. And um, I'm just going to gradually go through and, and show you some of the historic maps back when uh, California was an island in 1657. Um, and uh, you can see Upper Oregon and, or Lower Oregon and Upper California as of 1853 using hatchers uh, to represent um, the landforms of the area, Cal Northern California in 1866. We're, we're doing right by the historians uh, today, I guess, with uh, coming on the heels of Michael's presentation. Um, the Northern section of California as of uh, 